Good afternoon. Uh, this is a short talk on the market for translations and for translators, for people concerned about employment. Okay, this is in response to your questions, as I will indicate very soon. Some years ago, not many, perhaps two or three, I was at a conference in Italy, and all these beautiful young Italian women like you, more or less. And I thought I gave them a pretty good talk on the translation market and new technologies, and it was academic and detailed, and I gave facts and numbers. And then right after me, this, this guy, actually it was uh, Renato, the guy about last week who did, said quality doesn't matter. Anyway, a guy from the localization industry got up, grabbed the microphone, walked around among the people with the microphone, and showed them this. Earthrise. Oh, you're on the moon. Earth he says, prior to history, in the era of my grandfather and my father, nobody dreamed we would ever see this. The earth rising over the moon. This is your brave new world. The translation industry is like this. There are new technologies, boundless new possibilities, and the whole world is opening up for you. They were so excited. All those beautiful young Italian, there were a few men, they were beautiful too. They all wanted to get into the translation industry and make lots of money because Renato had proved it with this photo. Okay, uh, that's to motivate people, and that's a good thing to do, I think, to motivate you and to show that there are many, many more possibilities out there than have been around in previous generations. So I've learned from him, and I've taken the photo, but I'm still going to try to give you some information as well. Why am I doing this? We've now done an analysis of your questions. You know, the first session, you, you wrote down three things you would like answered in this course. And here you are, the BA Vienna. And the yellow thing is the number of questions about the market, various shades of market. How do I get into the market? How do I find a job? How do I present my CV? How much money can I... Everybody asks, how much money can I make? Okay. Uh, now, that concern was a lot greater for you than for the MA group. As you can see, these are percentages. And then for the MA group that I have in Monterey, where it's rather more reduced as well. You're curiously obsessed with this, I suggest. And money, uh, direct questions about money, were far more important here than in either of the MA groups, right? And then correspondingly less important were the skills you require that you're going to exchange for the money on the market. Okay, you go out with skills, you sell the skills, you get some money, basically. We're going to look at that. Uh, the other groups are more interested in the skills that they're going to have to acquire in order to exchange them on the market. No comment. It's a leg legitimate place to be. But I mean, perhaps when you move on in two or three years, you'll start wondering, hey, what is it that I have got to sell, rather than, hey, how much is somebody going to pay me? Okay? I'll leave it there. I'm basing my work now on the study we did in 2000, dear me, 2012, so some time ago, but I don't think it's too far outdated. Um, I think there are exactly 333,000 full-time translators and interpreters in the world. Am I sure of this? No. Give or take 100,000. Okay? Uh, how did I get this number? I went to countries where people in their tax declaration, in their income reporting, uh, choose the job category, translation and interpreting. And I found five countries where that happens. I have a prior economist who calculated the translation market in the world for each particular country, so I could work out from that, extrapolate, and see how many there were, are in the world. 
There you go, 333,000. Uh, Austria in the translation economy is 0.48%, more or less. So there should be 1,598 full-time translators and interpreters in Austria. Why not? But uh, studies show that on average the translation profession has about 60% part-time employees. Okay, lots of high, high level of part-time employment. So that brings up the real number to 2,557. Exactly. You're writing this down. I don't believe these numbers. It's just a, an experiment. Okay. Uh, the um, main translators association in Austria has 731 members, which means it probably has you know about a third of the available people working. That sounds good, and it's, it's all right. It's fine. It's, Fits in, it's realistic. Now, let's say people enter the profession and they stay for 20 years on average. Some stay for 50, some 40, some 5, I don't know. But let's say 20. That means that each year, 128 people will retire. So there will be 128 jobs in Austria for translators and interpreters this year. I predict And I have 436 students enrolled in this course. It seems to me then that we'll, there will be a job for you, for each of you, uh, for one in four of you, more or less. Okay, and that's not good. You can leave now, run away, and say you didn't know it was so bad and things like that. All right. Is that a good way to approach it? I mean, these were the questions that you were asking me. How will I get it? How will I get to there? All right? And I suggest, no, that's not a good way to approach it because it gives the wrong answer. Well, it gives a real answer, but it has to be interpreted in some rather creative ways. Oh, what's that doing? Okay. Did I mention this before? No, in the other group. Okay, uh, we're looking at a profession, as I said, 60% uh, part-time. Freelancing, 74%, very high. People are not working in-house in companies. They're outside, selling their services, often to language provider companies, which then sell the translations on. And 70% are women, which is a nice thing to have, I think. Okay, um, that's, that's what the profession looks like as, as a as a social group. Uh, freelancing gives lots of freedom for women who want to bring up young children and other things. You know, you, you can make lots of suppositions on the basis of that, but that's about where we are. Okay, now let me look at the problem from a different perspective. The problem of you getting a good job. What's happening in cross-cultural communication in the world? Well, there's more and more of it, thanks to the technologies that allow globalization. There is lots more mobility of people and products and information. That means there's lots more crossing of languages. Companies these days uh, go beyond the national frame, go global, they say, and when they do, they require language skills. Where do the language skills come from? Can you see, I'm looking at this from the other perspective. How do people solve these problems? I don't know, that's, that's the question. Where do they get it? I don't think they're all employing full-time translators and interpreters, but they're getting language skills because they're solving these problems. Okay? Here's some other numbers. U.S. Labor Department. 42% increase in the market for translators and interpreters in 10 years. 42% in 10 years. It's got to tell you something. Something is happening in this sector. Okay? That's a huge rise. In, in German, Germany, Bundesagentur für Arbeit, 9.3% in the six years. So that sort of fits in as well. It's not as spectacular in the United States, but it's still a very healthy rise in the number of employed people in this sector. 
Service Canada 2012, uh, it just says it has increased significantly and the growing demand uh, is explained by the demand for information. In fact, in Canada, it's a peculiar phenomenon because they have official bilingualism, uh, a whole generation of translators and interpreters entered the, the government employment uh, in the 60s and 70s. They're now retiring, so there's actually lots of jobs now for uh, translators and interpreters because of that generational replacement type thing. So in those three instances, there are indications of a rise in demand. This is for the United States. This is taken from Common Sense Advisory, which is an information company in the United States. And you can see there year-on-year -year growth in the language sector. And again, from another source, this is calculating the market size and the revenue. You'll see there's year-on-year -year growth uh, in market size, although the revenue uh, is not as constant in its rise. Come on, mate. From all the sectors, there is growth in this economic sector. From all the, uh, all the sources, I mean. Here we have information on the fastest growing language services and technologies. That is, in general, the market is growing, but some parts of it are growing more than others. This is, again, it's from Common Sense Advisory. What does it say? Number one, translation is growing every year on year, followed by website, globalization, software localization, interpreting, and then we get into multimedia, telephone interpreting, translation technology, going right down the bottom to subtitling, which seems to be fairly stagnant. What does this mean? That there is growth in the industry and employment but it is uneven. It's more in some sectors than in others. Uh, things like subtitling, for example, are plagued by the, the rapid growth of uh, fan subbing, non-professional subtitling, which is handling a lot of the domain, a lot of the, 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 the market demand for that. Uh, what's peculiar is that translation comes out on top. Uh, what they mean by translation, though, requires some breakdown as well. Okay. It's, it's just interesting because generally we think that the growth areas are website localization and software localization. They are there, but translation is above them. The world market for translation services is very unequal. I don't know if you can see anything in that. Perhaps you can. Europe, 51.09% of the world market. Not bad. And another 37.8% in North America. This should tell you that we're talking about a particular industry that is very Western. Fundamentally here because of multilingualism, but also in the United States because it exports all over the world and is dealing uh, globally. Put the two together, 80-something percent of the market is between the United States and Europe. I like this because in trans... Yes, hello. I don't know. Oh, I can. Yes. Oh, you want to Latin America? <laughs> Not much. Okay. You, you make it bigger, okay? You, you push up that percentage. Uh, I find this intriguing because in translation studies we get a lot of criticism at the moment uh, about having a too Western view of translation, of, uh, of having you know, cultural imperialism and not, not seeing the diversity of translation practices over the world, which is very true. Uh, lots of very interesting things are happening in other parts of the world and there are many non-Western traditions of translation which are wonderful to explore. However, however, if we want to talk about the global language service industry, it's a Western industry, and we're in the middle of it. And it is growing. And you can see why Renato had the Earthrise and 
people excited. And yes, there is something in it. Okay? So how can we explain that these two things don't coincide? Well, even within Europe, you can see there that's the size of the industry. Here's another graph. This is from uh, FIT, that's the International Translators Federation in Europe, the European section of it. This is a survey of earnings um, in euro cents per word, okay, that, that you produce. Now, it's intriguing because it's very different even within Europe. Uh, who earns the most money? Well, in terms of country, the blue people do. Finland, right? Finland peaks over here at about 20 cents a word, okay? So if you want money, you know where to go. Head north, okay? <laughs> Who's the green guys? France is doing pretty well, all right? If you live in Spain, over here, you're not doing very well. Now, that's true. I, I do live in that market and I work in it. I get about 10 euro cents a word. So I'm here. Okay? I'm not, I'm not getting rich out of translation. Although I've had a good life and it was fun. You know, I quite enjoy it, but I can live well and eat well. But, you know. So it depends very much on what country you're in and what sector you're in and what kind of work you're doing. It's not one size fits all as a story. And the intriguing thing is who gets that sort of money out there? Who are those guys? Any guesses? I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I thought it was people who own translation companies, but actually they don't translate. No, they, they just organize things. European translators. Uh, DGT, uh, Director General for Translation. In-house translators in Brussels, in Luxembourg, ladies and gentlemen, could be the only people up there getting that sort of money. So people who asked, how do I get a job in, the, in, in Brussels and, and Luxembourg? Quite right. You can see it there. Go for it. I don't have to give you information. It's on their website. Okay? Uh, and there were questions about it. You know, oh, they only want the big language. No. They want a range of languages. If you have major European languages and a minor one and two, that's very, very interesting for them because they have to work into all the official languages of the European Union. Okay, the message being it is not uniform. It's better in some countries than others. Of course, if you go to Finland, you pay a lot more tax than you do in Spain and your cost of living is higher. Okay, so it's a... It's a calculation that can be made. Austria wasn't in the survey, I'm afraid. Neither was Germany. Anyway. The other thing that's happening and that messes it up is uh, the market grows. That is, the demand for translations grows. So people meet the demand, and the people meeting it tend to be bigger and bigger companies. In the 90s, the, the industry went through a system of mergers. Small companies joined into big, and big companies took over big companies. So you get, I don't know, Lionbridge is the biggest co translation company in the world. X SDL is up there, second biggest. And these, these big players really rule the game uh, for, for most of it. And they are run by uh, MBAs, by people with a Master's of Business Administration, people who know how to make money. How do you make money? You sell expensive and buy cheap. Okay? So they want to buy translation services. They buy it where they can buy it most cheaply. There is a strong tendency to outsourcing, outsourcing here, uh, particularly to India where people are well-educated, have very good English, can follow instructions, are obedient, and don't require a lot of money. 
And a lot of the translation is apply the glossary, apply the system, attention to detail. You don't need radical linguistic competence for it. Okay, so you can outsource to India certainly for anything with English, but also Spanish translation, they will do that as well. Uh, China as well can do your Spanish translation. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Okay, and then I was speaking to a to a guy working in a, in a localization company in Beijing, a big one. And I said, you know, do you get work outs outsourced? Yes, we get work outsourced to us because our labor costs are cheaper. And then we outsource to Mongolia because it's even cheaper out there. For Mongolia, I don't know where they go. But you get the, the cheapest translator in the world up on the top of Mount Everest somewhere. Uh, I can go away. Okay. Uh, so part of the contradiction between the first analysis I did and, and the, the, the story of rapid growth is a lot of the growth is being handled by outsourcing of labor sources. Okay, so the, the, the labor we sell, the skills we sell in the international scale are relatively expensive because we have to live in expensive places and we've come to luxuriously expensive. No, this isn't expensive, is it? But, you know, good universities and things like that. All right. So, now, here's another way of looking at it. Um, I'm talking about, I just use the term translation companies or language service provider or localization companies. These are all basically the same thing these days. You'll have a big company that sells language services and it sells localization. Do you know what localization means? You do. Everybody. If you don't, then I won't tell you. Oh, good, I'll tell you. Um, basically, it means if you get, um, it, it, the term was developed for software, if you have to put your software from American English into Austrian German, somebody has to translate all those strings, right? Those bits of code and language, okay, into German. But then we have to know that it's operational. And the hotkeys that you use will have to be changed. For example, in English, I go Control O to open. In German, what do you do? Control O for okay. In Spanish, it's Control A for abrir. Right, no. 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 that has to be done. Uh, colors have to be changed. Currency has to be changed. Date format has to be changed. All that has to be repackaged. You have to test that it works, and that all has to be managed. And so that is a big package called localization, all right? So it's translation plus a whole lot of other services, if you like, all right? Now, a localization project in general, it could be big product documentation. It could be website. Often it's, it's website plus documentation and whatever else has to happen in the company. Your translation costs are about a third. It varies a lot, but this is a rough rule of thumb. This is from uh, Reinhard Scheler. About a third goes for translation. About a half is for other things. Hello? And then the, the blue bit is your profit, which they like. So what's all these other things? I mean, we tend to think where the guy's translating. No, translation just here means natural language string replacement. The bits of language visible on the screen are taken from English and put into German. That's a relatively easy step when you look at everything else that's involved. The most money goes to the person able to bring this project in on time, the project manager, the person who can bring together different skill sets, make them work, make them coordinated, and above all, do not go beyond the deadline. Often the translation quality goes down because the speed has to go up because you have to finish on time to get to market, to beat your rival, or to have simultaneous shipment of your product in many languages as most uh, software companies do these days, okay? 
terminology becomes a huge thing because we're going to have about 20 to 30 to 50, I don't know, different translators working on the same project and they have to use the same word for the same thing. Even better, they should use the same phrases. They should have the same phraseology as well. They've got to sound similar. So terminology management becomes a lot of work. I should have put, yeah, let's go down there. Yeah, uh, it means that you get a lot of uh, post-editing happening as well. Let me go through bit by bit, though. Then there are people who come in and act as intercultural consultants, and they know how to make this product look uh, sexy in Taiwan. I don't know how you do that, but somebody must know how to do that. That there's a lot of marketing and re-visualizing of a product in some cases, depending on what you're selling, of course. Uh, but look at the way they sell the same model car all over the world. Or a good exercise, if you've got time and you're interested, go to, uh, is it Ike Ikea? Ike how do you pronounce it? Ikea? You know Ikea? It's, it's everywhere, right? Where's it from? Sweet. Rubbish. No, I mean, it, they're really good marketing because they sell the same furniture all over the world in different ways in each country. Okay, and if you look at it, just, just go around their language websites, you'll see how much redesign and marketing goes into uh, selling the same product everywhere in the world. Um, you think it's Swedish because at the top it's got a little Swedish color and sometimes it has blue and yellow in its color combination. It's actually a cultural foundation registered in the Netherlands. Uh, so it doesn't pay tax. <laughs> no? It's a cultural foundation supporting young designers. Uh, that's, that's clever, Mark. Alright, uh, beyond that, desktop publishing, the people who can put the graphics and the language together and make it work well on the website or on your uh, software uh, interface. There is a lot of use of machine translation because we're talking about big projects and you need experts able to make that work, able to keep and maintain the database that you need. Then you need people who can write so that text goes through machine translation. You have pre-editors, copy editors, people who write in controlled language with a limited range of syntactic operations. And then post-editors, people who can correct what the machine translation produces. Probably other things as well, depending on the product. There you go, revision, copy editing becomes incredibly important. Uh, because as I said, different translators have to sound like the one voice. And that's quite a feat. So where does 50% go? Not to translators, they get the 30%. All these guys get the other money. So what kind of skills do you think you would like to market? The translation skills that go out to India, and we're not in India, or something on this other side of business, which is still using language for the most part, and a lot more, and could be quite lucrative for you. This explains how it is that the industry grows, but the traditional translation number of translators seems not to be growing by that much in our part of the world. This could explain it. That people with training in languages and cultures are doing things other than translating or next to translating, at least paratranslational activities. It's not just hardcore sentence for sentence, language for language. There's a lot of other things going on there as well. Have I shown you this? Yes? Okay, then I'll show you again. Remember how, according to this model, uh, professional translators, thanks to the technologies, which is when I showed it to you, can interact with uh, field area experts, with knowledge experts, uh, volunteers. You can have professionals interacting with volunteers. And where were the key fields that would require those experts in the revision process and the stylistic editing process. 
making it sound good, writing really well in your target language. That's where these kinds of jobs have to open up as well. This is from a study done by a doctoral student of mine in Greater China. She tackled this problem, this problem, this question, uh, from a different perspective. She got lists of the people who had graduated from translation schools in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Guangzhou and tried to see where they finished up. And that's another way, you know. Hey, they're not all working as translators, we know that. But what are they doing? She found them in communication departments, public relations, language service providers, in-house, the people in the companies, okay? Uh, freelancers, that's working for the language service provider for the company, and many other things. Many of them in journalism, uh, but she had a background in journalism herself, so it was sort of, you know, she, she, she could contact them more easily, I guess. Um, I should here explain that a typical language service provider will have in-house its big boss, usually MBA, knows how to make money, a couple of project managers who don't work on computers, they work on their cell phones, screaming at people at all days. The, uh, I had a former girlfriend who did that. I should, uh, middle of the night, I have to phone states, I have to phone Israel. That's horrible. Don't, don't, don't. I mean, do that, get the money, but do not have that person as your girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> no? um, actually, yeah, I was talking about this the other day. The, okay, you've got the project manager. I was doing a course in project management, and, and I did it with a, a guy who was doing a master's with us. He had worked in project management in a localization company, that is, with languages. He then went on to do projects in advertising, because he was good at that, at visualizing things. So he worked for one of the main um, uh, advertising companies in, in Barcelona, and now he's managing a hotel. Okay, I mean, at one level, management is management. If you know how to manage a translation project, you can manage a publicity project, you can manage a hotel. It's transferable skills. And languages are useful in all of those. Okay. So, uh, the company will have very few people there. You know, the, the project managers, the engineers, terminologists, people who are good at revising would be in-house. There might be five to ten people in-house. And then a long list of freelancers who are employed when there is work available for them in their languages and their fields of expertise. That would be the typical model of the kinds of companies that are being set up these days. There is relatively little in-house translating in a big company. Uh, European Commission, for sure, you have in-house. The whole people go to work, have an office, they are translators. Uh, but car manufacturers, for example, if they have some translators in-house, they'll tend not to be a lot of them. They'll tend to be outsourced. I know I visited the localization department in Google and they had, I don't know, 10, 12 really brilliant young people. Oh, they were so good. I was so old. I was a grandfather. Um, no, it's true. They call it a campus and it's like a university where all the brilliant students escaped and can do whatever they like. And um, uh, it was interesting because the people there were in the head languages, they all had very good languages, but they didn't have to have a degree in anything special. And I was working with a, a, a girl, uh, they were interested in setting up a certification system because they outsourced to so many companies, they couldn't control the quality of what they were getting, and so they were trying to set up this system uh, to certify their translators. Now she had a PhD in, in uh, education. How did you get from education, science, to doing this? Oh, it's all management. It's all organizing things. This is interesting. It also pays very well. Which, you know, uh, they didn't care where people came from. They just wanted you to have bright ideas. And these were the people who produced new ideas 
to keep Google rich and us happy using Google. All right. Given that configuration, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in-house, work there for 40 years, retire, get a villa in Italy on the coast? That's, a bit, that's okay. All right. You can do that, but the number of in-house jobs is declining. You are more likely to find work freelancing and freelancing in a lucrative way. Now, this is a study done by... Um, Michael Gold is an economist, and Janet Fraser is a translator. Okay? And, uh, they did a study of what's happening in the UK market. Hmm. Here's this. Okay, all right. They found that the younger translators are the least likely to look for an in-house job, and they are the most likely to take on the entrepreneurial, the business type aspects themselves. All right? They also found, it seems not to be there, but anyway, that people who had lost their jobs as in house translators and interpreters, and because of an economic recession, went from in house into freelancing. They were interviewed, they asked, Do you want to go back to in house work? And most of them said never. Uh, once you go free, you don't go back. Uh, that they really appreciated the capacity to control their own rhythm of work, their own working day, and that that was more valuable to them than the greatest job security, unemployment benefits, pension plan, everything else that you get in an in-house job. Uh, so the structure of employment is changing radically. Uh, there is far greater activity, dynamism in a freelance market where you look after your own welfare and your own pension plan, social security, uh, than working for a company. Oh, this is interesting too. Leo, sorry, this was the girl I was citing previously. What a mess. Uh, she found that tra people trained as translators were working as account executives, like in a publicity agency or marketing, communication consultant, corporate communication specialist, whatever that is, marketing communications executive, public affairs specialists. But I mean, the, the job titles are really creative. I think Bert Esslink uh, is a, a translator, a, a project manager for um, Lionbridge, at one stage, he phoned me and said, hey, I've got a new job. What are you, Bert? I'm a, a solutions architect. Uh, so his job was actually whenever the client, something goes wrong with the uh, Lionbridge providing the language services, lots of technology and stuff, he's the guy that comes in and fixes it, fixes up the problem. Okay? The communication doctor would have been nice as well. So you can have any kind of job title there. It's not easy to see that these people are using their language skills and communication skills with those job, job titles. So a lot of the actual employment goes underground beneath different job titles for different kinds of jobs. Oh, that's, that's what I was talking about. Okay. That uh, people who go freelance uh, tend to stay freelance. They, they like it. This is from a job advertisement published in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Not that I'm a regular reader of the Cincinnati Enquirer. But again, this is a, another student of mine who works in, uh, she works for Siemens in the United States uh, on software. They're looking for someone to work in the software division of Siemens. You require. Can you read it for yourself? Can you see translation there? Find it. I mean, you need all these things, but translation is there. Ah, come on. Yeah. Bachelor's or equivalent degree in the target language or translation. 
Okay, they don't require you to have studied translation in, in the, the language you're going into would be good enough. But look at all the things they're looking for, all those skills and capacities. Lots of it technical, but also teamwork, ability to get on with others, etc. Uh, time management. All these things are as important to them as your skills as a translator. As, as the Venisage will say in an hour or so, translators do more than translate. Okay, here you have it. This is what they were looking for. I'm going to finish early. Okay, that's all right. Uh, so the message is, uh, be prepared to play the game, but play it on, a, on the widest possible field. If you are just focused on, focused on translation and interpreting, you're going down too narrow an alley to see the most interesting opportunities that are opening up. They're opening up because of globalization, trade, and economic activity, and the technologies. Look around for everything else that is happening and ask yourself if you could go for that job or that job or that job. Once you're in it, uh, things tend to happen of their own momentum. Here is a game you can play. This is a bit of Bourdieu, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. He is there. He died some years ago. He was not my teacher, but I did attend some of his seminars, and he was wonderful. Uh, very cynical. I'll explain why in a minute. Bourdieu says that in life, we accumulate capitals, not just capital as in money, but there are other kinds of economies operative in social life. We can be obsessed with money, but there are other things. For example, symbolic capital, the prestige. People can get something in order to get prestige. You know, you buy that really expensive coat. Why? Because you think it looks good. No, because people will think you're the person who can afford that expensive coat, and so you get prestige. All right? Or, okay, professional certification would be prestige, if you like. Um, symbolic capital. Yeah, I was discussing with my daughter where should she study. She's going, she's in Paris, she's studying around. She can go there, there, or there. This one has the best teachers, this one... And this one is the Sorbonne. And I say, Juliet, Sorbonne. It's not good. I know it's not good. Don't tell anybody. But outside, in the United States or wherever else, they'll, they'll recognize where you're from. You buy prestige. She bought prestige. I bought prestige. Anyway, I have to pay for it. Yeah. Educational qualifications, your symbolic capital, what you can actually do. Okay? Uh, your, your cultural, your, um, wait a minute. Yeah, educate your symbolic capital. Symbolic capital, same thing, right? Experience what you know, okay? Uh, your cultural capital. This would be your languages, your uh, ability to use certain technologies, your ability to work with other people, you know, all these different skills that you have, they come into your cultural capital, what you can actually do. Okay, Then you have your social capital, the people you know. My mother used to tell this to me. It's not what you know, it's who you know. I was bad, I went and studied too many books, I fixed on the, on the what and I didn't do the who well enough. However, uh, referees, social capital, who you know is very important. And then economic capital, financial success. Now this usage of four capitals is interesting because in life you can convert any kind of capital into another kind of capital. Okay? So you can buy an expensive MBA. You invest economic capital in order to get symbolic capital. You might also get uh, cultural capital. You, you learn some skills. And very importantly, you will get to know some potentially rich people. And so you get a whole lot of social capital. 
But some people only know influential people. But they use their contacts to get a job where they can get financial success. You can convert social capital <clears throat> into economic capital. Okay, and so on. Think about anything you do. <clears throat> but think about this. Why would people do fan subbing? Why would they translate subtitles for free? They get zero economic capital. What do they get? Well, they learn how to do it, the cultural capital. They make friends online discussing something they like, their favorite film or TV series, that's social capital. And they can put on their CV if they like, have subtitled these great films. You don't have to say you did it for free, but anyway. And, and that will give you a bit of symbolic capital as well. I mean, what else are you going to do? Sit down and stare out the window? No, you can gain some capitals. And when you've got those three, you can go and present yourself for a job that actually pays you to do subtitling. As does happen. What happens when you accept a low-paying job in a large, prestigious company? Well, you sacrifice the economic capital, but you hope that you'll meet some people and you develop your social capital and you'll get some skills and develop your cultural capital. But it usually doesn't work. You know why? Because you don't get the prestige. You don't get that symbolic capital. Uh, the story of the young store clerk who started at the bottom of the company and rose to be the president of the company belongs to a prior age, I suggest. Uh, most often, people enter high-paying positions in company structures straight in, vertically, no, horizontally, from other employment or, or um, expensive trade. Uh, that, that's a trap. That's a trap. To think you start at the bottom and to work your way up the top. It can be done, but these days it's far more difficult. This, however, is a typical if you look at the numbers of writers, some of them very great writers, who started off translating. Uh, first, to get some money, uh, but often they learned how to write by translating. They gained cultural capital, which they could then uh, transfer into other fields. An expensive master's degree, I've already mentioned. It's uh, a lucrative investment. I don't know what's studying here. Try to analyze your own presence here in terms of your investment, financial investment, time, etc. And then try to analyze what kind of trade-off, what can you exchange that for? And I think it's a good analysis for your, you to do. It will help you focus on what you can get. Um, I suspect, just quietly, you're not getting enough of the real skills you need in order to exchange that further on down the line. When I teach alongside professional translators and interpreters, they look askance at me like that. So what are you doing here talking about research on translation or translation theory? What a useless activity. They don't say it to my face, but they say it behind my back. Okay? How dare you, they say, come in and tell people how to translate. Or, or, and I say, I don't do theory, I do research. I say, look, I'm presenting the numbers and things like that. No, no, no. It's all useless theory because theorists don't know a thing. Okay, now in terms of the capitals, why should we be doing translation theory? Because it legitimizes our activity within a university structure. And why should we have a university structure? Because it gives the profession, the, the profession prestige, symbolic capital. And why does the profession need symbolic capital? So we can exchange that for economic capital, get rich. The function of what I'm doing is to enhance the social prestige, 
and symbolic prestige of the profession. That's why people do it. Okay? If you analyze it in economic terms, you'll never understand that. But if you analyze it in terms of all four capitals working together, it starts to make sense. Why should you be here? To get the prestige, to get the symbolic capital. There are also frequent calls within industry, within the translators groups more than the industry, complaining that they are underpaid and should be more paid, uh, better paid, and that governments should spend more money on translation and interpreting services. Why not? Okay, that would benefit the users and benefit the providers of the services. That's us and people who really need help. That's okay. But if you just make it as a call, hey, spend more money, it tends not to work. You have to be able to demonstrate the virtues of your activity, and to do that, it certainly helps to speak to the right people, personally. Okay? The, it can't just be an ethical thing. You have to get to people and speak to them and explain it in detail, face to face. Uh, it's the importance of, of the personal context, and make it a prestigious activity with a symbolic value, not just in terms of its economic returns, but its symbolic returns for whoever is providing the money. Okay? Often companies spend money just to buy prestige, to buy goodwill, to buy a company image, and part of our services could be sold in that way, I suggest. Play with that. I'm almost finished, I think. Almost. Am I? Here's, this is not the theory now. This is from somebody who has been looking for work all their whole life. And I see it on the other side as well, because I also give jobs. In fact, what's today? Last week, I was in a committee when we had four job candidates, and we had to decide between four. It's a terrible position to be in. But I know what it's like. How do you choose between four? Okay, so this is, um, I don't know, what is it? paternalistic advice. Mm -hmm. Take it or leave it. This is not the theory. This is just from my experience in this particular industry over the years, in the translation and academic industry. Have a plan. Decide where you want to be in five years, in ten years, where I would really want to be. And the biggest mistake that I find among my students, and even my children, is that they aim too low. And in myself. Where you really want to be. Not where you think you are because you're not very good. No. There. You want to be there. Okay? About two steps above what you think you deserve. Go for that one. Okay? That's where you want to get. And have that mission. You're never going to get there in a straight way, and you're going to find something else off there and off there. But I mean, if you don't have the plan, you won't motivate yourself to get out there and sell what you've got to sell. At the same time, when you face this wall of refusals, or you keep going for your 10th interview, and you still don't get the job, and you think, nobody cares about me, nobody wants me. Remember this, it's like falling in love. Somebody out there is looking for you. Okay, Somebody out there is an employer saying, why can't I get the perfect employee with exactly these things that I need? Somebody on the other side is looking. It's just a matter of making the right contact, and that can be difficult. When you're in a competitive situation, as happened last week, figure out what your relative advantage is, your competitive advantage. What is it that you've got that they haven't? It's, you're not going to get it coming along and say, well, like everybody else who's been through the BA program at the University of Vienna, I have this, this, and this. No way. It's just you. You're the person that's got to communicate to that person there and you've got to come out and say, 
My relative advantage is I'm really great at these languages and I've traveled to that country and I have experience in this, this, and this. And you push those things and highlight them. You have to stand out and you will stand out and somebody will take notice. And that especially concerns in our industry your range of languages. Even if your C, D, E languages are a bit weak, still put them on the curriculum. Okay? Don't put them there as regular languages you're going to speak in, but uh, the range of languages is symbolically attractive to companies who never really know what's going to happen down the line. Okay? And the obvious thing is be prepared to look for more than translation and interpreting. That is, acquire the skills uh, that are, go beyond your language skills and present yourself, go for jobs that go beyond those that just say language and interpret. I think I might... Oh, oh yeah, and you only need one job at a time. Yeah? It's like, it's a lottery. I mean, somebody's got to win. Huh? You'll win. We all win at some stage.